Well, thanks everybody for sticking with us. The last full session of the day. Um, uh, I'm Andy Excellence again. Uh, I'm the chair of the Association of British Science Writers. Hopefully you saw me earlier. Um, just going to crack on with it. Our next session is on COVID-19 data and news audiences. Uh, we'll have three 15-minute talks from speakers, um, a 10-minute response from Lawrence McGinty according to the schedule, and, um, uh, and then Q&A at the end. So um, I'll start straight away by introducing the University of Sheffield's Helen Kennedy who will talk to us about communicating data visually, I believe. Is that correct, Helen? Yes. Can you see my slides? Certainly can. Yeah. Please okay. do take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's been a really interesting day, one that makes me want to say not exactly what I intended to say 24 hours ago. Um, there's been a lot of thought-provoking comment so I sort of try to weave in some re reflections about the day with um, what I was gonna what, I, what my presentation is about so um, I think we've established that uh, there's been a proliferation not only of data but also of visual representations of data uh, in the news as a result of uh, the coronavirus um, pandemic and um, so early on, one even became famous. Now, this, this is boring now, but it was quite exciting in April that, uh, you know, flattened the curve, kind of entered people's vocabulary, that some new stories uh, led with this visual, which according to um, interviews that I've done in newsrooms with people working with data visualizations is quite an unusual move that news stories would normally lead off with a human interest visual like a photo and then have the kind of um, visual representations um, of data kind of below the line. So we've got line charts becoming so famous that data visualizer Andy Kirk um, said we need to flatten the curve of the flatten the curve line chart. We need kind of less of them and less variations of them. So simple data visualizations are key to communicating information about the pandemic, but how do people engage with them? Are they effective and what effects uh, do they have? Now, I think we've established that people's ability to make sense of graphs and charts and maps is more important than it has ever been. And that's the case if we are to believe um, as proponents of data visualization uh, claim that data viz make data and statistics accessible and transparent and so promote greater understanding of them. And it, but it also matters if we're to believe what more kind of critical commentators say, which is that data visualizations privilege, can privilege certain views of the world, can obscure other views of the world and so can do ideological work. So whichever kind of view or kind of place on the spectrum we, we might um, situate ourselves, people's graphicacy, that is their ability to make sense of graphs and charts and maps is important and graphicacy has been seen to combine maths um, skills with visual literacy skills, with language skills, with computing skills and importantly with critical thinking skills. Now these critical thinking skills are especially important aren't they if we think about some of the things that we've seen today. So Timandra was showing us that bar chart where um, age, groups, age groups were not consistently the same size and what was, resent, what was represented was whole numbers are not not percentages so um, people need these critical thinking skills to to kind of decode what is going on in some of these data visualizations um, and another example that, that occurred to me during coronavirus was when the government's press pack changed its starting point from um, 50, the 50th death being recorded to the 2000th death being recorded in order to kind of obscure the, ex oh, well, let's say, you know, it seemed to be in order to obscure the exponential rise in deaths in the UK compared to other um, EU countries. 
And, and I've done a lot of interviews with um, data visualizers who would also want to see um, members of the public developing these um, critical thinking skills. So how do we find out about people's graphicacy, their ability to think cr critically about data that's represented to them? How do we uh, understand the extent to which news reporting of COVID data can change hearts and alter minds, which is one of the questions that the whole day was focusing on, or looking at the challenges of engaging lay audiences? And I would say that we do that by talking to people. Um, so we've had some references to some um, quantitative work with audiences, for example, you know, uh, surveys and polls about do you trust your understanding of the data or, or you know, what kind of um, actors do you trust uh, in this kind of landscape? And that is important, but I think that um, it's really important to get at what is going on for people when they look at a data visualization if we want them to be effective and it, th I think that necessitates qualitative um, work and qualitative research so conversations focus groups and interviews with people and I think um, you know there's been quite a lot of talking here about um, there was a bit of a conversation early on about our, our sort of data journalists teaching people or informing people. There's been a lot of reference to, to literacy, um, references to lay people. Lay people just don't get what it means for a vaccine to be 95% effective. And I do think we need to be really careful about the language that we use when we talk about people and when we talk to people um, about these things because I think some some of this language is, is less helpful and um, slightly more judgmental and pejorative and I, I don't think that is fruitful for, for us kind of getting at what is going on for people when they engage with a data visualization and I, I think that one word that is really not helpful is literacy so there's a, um, an edited collection that I've got a slide for at the end here and a PhD student of mine, Lulu Pinney, writes in there about how talking to people about literacy is not, is, isn't helpful, partly because of its opposite, which is illiteracy or, or to be illiterate and the, and the negative connotations of that. So I do think we need to be kind of careful about the language that we use. And I think that we need to um, be attentive to differences. Um, I, there's been a little bit of reference to difference during the day and maybe a li little bit more in the afternoon than in the morning, but I think Phil Schlesinger's point was that, um, you know, sort of the extent to which social inequalities pervade um, what we're talking about here today, not only health outcomes, but the extent to which people trust data experts and science, for example. Social inequalities pervade kind of all of these things. Um, and I don't think we'll get to very good understanding of what is going on with people when they engage with the data visualization if we don't kind of acknowledge that. So I've been doing this kind of thing for quite a long time. Uh, I worked on the project Seeing Data in 2014, which is about how people engage with data visualizations. Um, you know, I, I'm going to come back to the sort of issue around um, inequalities, but, you know, we saw that all sorts of things affect how people engage. You know, we've got a kind of shared urgent subject matter here with the pandemic but other things like the source or, or location of a, a data visualization people's beliefs and opinions the time they have available emotions especially were really important i was really glad to, to hear the day kicked off with an acknowledgement that feelings matter in this space and also people's confidence in their own um, skills and all of these things kind of um play into how people engage with data visualizations and also why they do and in literature about effective um, data visualizations effectiveness is almost always understood stood as memorability and speed of comprehension as if 
comprehending something quickly and being able to remember it are the only things that matter when people look at a data viz or um, the only reasons that people turn to data viz um, in the first place. So, um, you know, sort of two main findings um, from this research was this, you know, in the importance of taking seriously the role of emotions here, um, you know, the Trump and uh, and co get this and speak to emotions and, and we need to find a way of taking this seriously whilst dealing in um, kind of scientific statistics and data and, and another thing that we kind of um, concluded from that research was you know let's think about what makes something effective in much kind of broader terms so you know we heard earlier people saying that the job of the scientist is is to inform but, you know, the job of maybe other communicators, maybe we should be asking ourselves, and then what? And then what do we want people to do once we have informed them through these visual representations of data? So following on from this research, I worked on a project called INVIL, which was funded by the Norwegian Research Council, where one part of it that I worked on was doing um, interviews in 60 newsrooms across Europe about how people in newsrooms are working with uh, visualizations. And I found really interesting assumptions about audiences um, there. So I found that some people working in newsrooms with visualizations felt that their audiences naively assume that data visualizations represent truths about the world. And in complete contrast, some other participants felt that audiences are too skeptical of the data visualizations that they see in the news. They think that audience skepticism combined with the proliferation of misinformation makes audiences perceive data visualizations as subjective, biased or fake, even when they're not. Um, so sort of really interesting assumptions going on there about audiences, but they are that they are, they are kind of speculation. Um, and so where I'm at now is I'm sort of recognizing that, you know, my C in data research um, took place in, in a different era uh, when there were far fewer data visualizations in the news, especially in the sort of simple and standardized formats of bar charts and line charts that proliferate today. And so um, I, I feel a need to sort of revisit that how do people engage question with a focus on these more standardized um, data visualizations and to ask, um, you know, about their effects. So this is a project that's just started. It's called Generic Visuals in the News. Um, and it's asking these questions about whether um, generic, what we call generic visuals, bring people together around shared interests or concern. Do they activate people or not to care about issues? Do they make possible or not? various forms of engagement? Do they facilitate or in, inhibit the spread of disinformation or misinformation? And I also found in the, in the newsroom research concern about how um, a visual representation of data might be sort of stripped from its context and circulated in the wild and used to kind of back up misinformation. So, um, you know, we, we have a strong interest in, in the role that visuals play in the circulation of misinformation and the relationship between trust and visuals um, in the research that we've just sort of embarked on uh, um, right now and haven't really got any findings to present yet. Um, but the final point that I wanted to make um, relates to the issue of trust, which has come up a lot today. And I guess I just want to to, to kind of say, like qualitative researchers often do, that trust is really complicated. Um, and and we've working with collaborators, we've come up with this term complex ecologies of trust. So we've done research, this, this is moving beyond what do people think of data visualizations to, to looking at how do people um, think and feel about data uses more generally or data practices like data collection, data sharing. Um, and so on. And so for one project that I've worked on looked at what people thought about the uses to which data about them were being put when the BBC introduced a requirement that you sign into its iPlayer. 
And we found, you know, lots of different levels of trust and distrust kind of interacting with each other. So people may or may not trust the BBC. They may or may not trust the BBC with their data. So they might trust the BBC, but not trust the BBC with their data. They may or may not um, trust what we described as the broader data ecosystems. So, so concerns about broader um, security um, might play in, uh, come into play there. And they may or may not trust themselves with the sharing of their data. So, so trust is um, firstly very complex. And I think that complexity can get written out of some kind of headline figures about who people trust and the extent to which people trust. And the other thing that I think gets written out of conversations about trust is, as I, as I sort of alluded to, the fact that um, inequalities shape the extent to which people trust. So both historically and more recently, it's been found that the privileged have higher levels of trust than the less privileged. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. Um, and um, so, yeah, here's, a, here's an article where you can read more of what we had to say about that. that. And in kind of, um, you know, drawing attention to the ways that inequalities kind of um, play out in this area, um, I'm drawing on the work of Rua Benjamin, who, who uses the concept of informed refusal to make sense of the distrust that she comes across in her research on race. Informed refusal is the opposite of informed consent, which she says falsely assumes that the transmission of information will result in the granting of permission. And she says that in the case of racialized communities, what we need to do is to unpack the racial logics of trust um, and to see the problem, to recast the problem of distrusting citizens as an issue of um, social justice. So there's a sort of suggestion here that we shouldn't be focusing on how can we get people to trust more. We should be thinking about whether the things that we would desire people to trust are indeed trustworthy in the first place. And we should also be thinking about the roots of distrust. Um, so yeah, I think I'll um, uh, end it there. This is the book that I mentioned before. It's um, available open access, so free to download from um, Amsterdam University Press. And so, so lots of excellent contributions, sort of looking more at what's going on, what's at stake when people engage with data visualizations. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. There's some, some questions there related to data visualization I don't think I've ever personally thought about. So you've given me food for thought and uh, hopefully the audience, uh, which is a good point for me to remind everyone that uh, questions in the Q&A at, uh, at the bottom of my screen anyway, um, if you have any for Helen and the others. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll move on to Stuart Allen. Um, who is from Cardiff University. Hopefully you saw him earlier, so I won't give him a great introduction uh, other than just to say, Stuart, are you, are you ready to, um, to, to uh, take over and, and give your presentation on citizen sciences synergies for improving science reporting during the COVID-19 pandemic? Great. Thank you, yes, I'm all set. Uh, well, I'm very pleased to, uh, to be joining uh, this uh, panel. Uh, Helen uh, certainly has us off to a, a really excellent uh, start. Uh, my contribution today aims to build on our discussion by exploring how best to enrich the quality of science journalism in this pandemic era by examining citizen science. And uh, as has been mentioned uh, by Andy, I, I did uh, speak earlier today on the uh, opening panel after the uh, keynote. So I've done some chopping and changing to, uh, to reduce my paper, I hope, uh, to closer to the 10 minute mark so as to create a little bit more space for us in the, in the Q&A sessions. Um, we've heard a lot today about the, uh, the symbiotic nature of the scientist-journalist relationship and how quickly it can become rather hotly, uh, acrimoniously contested under certain circumstances at times especially when questions of, of risk or uncertainty become controversial. And in, in thinking that relationship through and where it, where it situates members of the public, um, I've been drawing on scholarly inquiries into the boundary work of scientists, 
uh, that have been conducted over the years, uh, many of which show how certain idealized visions have served as a means to protect professional uh, autonomy. Uh, and this includes by normalizing their proclaimed, the scientists or the proclaimed authority, uh, reinforcing claims to expertise, uh, even defining rivals as, as outsiders, uh, and not least with regard to the non-scientist or the amateur. And that uh, is what really kind of intrigues me in thinking about these kind of fluid, unevenly evolving boundaries of scientific communities and how they've been defined contingently is much by relations of exclusion as well as inclusion. And part of the sort of informing my work in this area is, is past research I've done around citizen journalism, where you see a number of, of similarities. In fact, it's, it's often quite striking to see the, the shared investment that both scientists and journalists have, admittedly to varying degrees, in, in a sense of method, a sense of protocol, a particular preferred way of doing things, which is aligned with epistemological uh, commitments um, that are, are recognizable as being consistent with professionalism. Uh, a shared kind of investment in a sense of objectivity, for example, uh, really uh, suggests that, that science, scientific discourses percolate away within journalistic contexts uh, in, in often somewhat surprising ways. I say surprising because I think a lot of scientists have kind of let go of some of these kind of guiding tenets and no longer subscribe to them with the same intensity that, that used to be the case. Whereas journalism, for a variety of interesting reasons, and this would be a different presentation than one I'm about to give, uh, continue to kind of want to, to hold on to them. And, and I think that that is itself interesting. Um, so in, in trying to think about what, what counts as uh, science uh, and in turn who can be counted as a scientist. Uh, I think the the whole area of citizen uh, science then becomes really interesting and, I, and I'm guessing that most people in this uh, 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 symposium today, uh, everyone who's, who's, uh, who's watching and, and speaking, um, already is, is reasonably well aware of, of citizen science so I won't go into any any great detail there. I've, I've put on this slide a number of of examples which uh, at a glance kind of highlight some of the ways in, in which it's been evolving over the years. Interestingly, the, the Oxford English Dictionary didn't uh, introduce the notion of citizen science until 2014. But I think we would be uh, mistaken if we thought that it was in effect a, a relatively new concept. Uh, we might not have actually been using the phrase citizen science for that long, but certainly, well, I would suggest anyway, and perhaps argumentatively, maybe some will find this polemic, uh, polemical point. Uh, I would suggest that uh, right from the emergence of, the, of something recognizable as the scientist, uh, that you had individuals who were engaged in a scientific related activity, but not sufficiently so to be included within that definition of the scientist. So I, I would suggest that, that actually our notion of kind of the citizen scientist, even if we weren't using that, that word or that kind of vocabulary to describe it is arguably as, as old as as our discourses around scientists that they've always been clearly defined by by who's included but also crucially who's excluded who's left out who's seen to be falling short of deserving that kind of, uh, of recognition certainly as well a further complicating factor is of course uh, there's lots of other phrases that are used to describe citizen science uh, sometimes it's called community science uh, crowdsourced science, uh, even just crowd uh, science, civic science, volunteer uh, science and the like. So again, a whole plethora of different kind of terms there to, to get at this idea of the, of the amateur or certainly the, the non-professional scientist engaged in scientific uh, activity. And for a whole host of, of different kinds of reasons, you know, we don't have time to kind of delve into to all of these. But uh, there at a, at a glance, you can sort of get a sense of some of the, the varied uh, rationales uh, that uh, people who sort of self-describe themselves as citizen science, scientists, uh, who seem to have some sort of affiliation or, or wish to be kind of seen through that particular prism, uh, might explain why they are motivated to be involved. And these are some of the, uh, the factors that come to light. 
and and there's a whole host and wherever you look on the on the web you can come across uh, really interesting uh, examples of this i mean this is one i'll just pause on for a second because i this is just a lot of the citizen scientists uh, are involved in environmentally related uh, work uh, at least up until fairly recently uh, and here's an example of you know the plastic tide which if you take a look at uh, online you'll see it's uh, it's all about harnessing the power of drone technology uh, in rather interesting ways, gathering imagery, and then calling upon ordinary members of the public to kind of identify what the images are showing and tagging them as a result, in a, such a way that it then is teaching, in effect, the algorithm to be able to kind of do this independently of human, direct human involvement. And uh, as the, uh, the science advisor to this project says, uh, and I quote, the plastic tide will significantly enhance our understanding of the amount of uh, plastic on the coastlines by driving a revolutionary drone-based atomic detection of the litter. Uh, and this will aid the creation of a global inventory of marine plastic pollution and help identify hotspots, uh, impacts on the fate of our plastic. Um, again, further motivations here, you can see that uh, much of it sometimes revolves around uh, people's use of their own technologies, not these smartphones. There's a similar kind of adage there that, that anyone equipped with a smartphone can in effect be a, a citizen scientist, uh, such as the power of, of the devices that have become part of everyday lives in, in relatively wealthy uh, uh, first world countries in particular. Uh, that uh, it, it sort of opens up these kinds of opportunities for engagement, which uh, uh, have, uh, I think, a, a really interesting kind of uh, materiality in everyday practice that, that needs unpacking and exploration. Now, it's very difficult to kind of generalize, of course, um, what counts as citizen science very much sort of shifts from, uh, well, from one person to the next in the eye of the uh, beholder. And there are you know, issues there in terms of the extent to which such an all-encompassing uh, category has uh, explanatory power. So I think that this is something which we need to kind of think through in the sense that we need to ensure that our, our concepts have a sufficient analytical uh, purchase in order to help uh, you know, us think through these kinds of dynamics. And the similar set of debates there around the, the citizen journalist as well. And, and there I'm struck that uh, you know, how infrequently that kind of logic is reversed. When you think about debates around citizen journalism, of course, we would also pause to recognize that the journalist himself is a citizen. Um, and that kind of implied binary really is actually a little bit more complicated than might uh, first appear to be the case. And I would say the same is true with citizen science, of course, and that is it invites questions about uh, the scientist as a citizen and what that means uh, in turn. Now, all of these kinds of issues um, have been really thrown into sharp relief by the emergence of the coronavirus uh, pandemic as a, as a global uh, phenomenon. And here too, you, I'm sure you've kind of come across uh, examples yourself uh, because it, it's pretty hard to avoid them really if you're online and, and engaging in issues around anything to do with the media and, uh, and the pandemic. Uh, you'll probably, before too long, uh, bump into uh, this kind of, uh, well, these, these kinds of initiatives. Uh, I would suggest it's, it's one of the few bright spots that's actually emerged from the pandemic in the sense that it has actually really strongly encouraged a lot of people to get uh, involved and to see ways in which they can contribute uh, through a whole variety of different kinds of citizens, citizen science platforms that have emerged or some of which have been re kind of repurposed and recalibrated. They, they were there already, but they've now suddenly got a very strong uh, uh, pandemic related uh, dimension. Uh, lots of people are finding themselves indoors for a lot longer than uh, more certainly typical of the case. Uh, some people with more time on their hands uh, and they in turn have been, uh, many of them have been, have been actively involved in, the, in online projects uh, to assist in this regard uh, than would have been the case um, before. Uh, there's a lot of kind of um, sort of almost celebratory rhetoric around the, the power of the crowd, uh, the extent to which ordinary citizens are helping to unlock data. You'll see references to the, the wisdom of the crowd, algorithms, um, certain kinds of issues of course ar ar arise, uh, people expressing their concern, um, some from outright kind of dismissals of this kind of involvement for fear that it cannot be adequately uh, 
corroborated, uh, questioning the authenticity of, of uh, the work that's produced, uh, raising questions around verification. These are all, of course, very le legitimate concerns. There are examples of even the most well-intentioned citizen scientists uh, making mistake, mistakes, getting things wrong, uh, complicating uh, matters. Same is true, of course, for, for scientists, but, but it's a special kind of concern where uh, the, the untrained uh, or, uh, person is, is involved in these processes. Although as some scientists have pointed out that, that even that is in itself kind of interesting and in that where there are slips and problems uh, where you get sort of uh, a lack of consensus around what appears to be sort of outlying or otherwise kind of odd data, that, that in itself can then warrant further uh, inquiry and further investigation, which uh, uh, can be rather useful uh, in its own terms. And there's been a number of different kinds of ways into incentivize involvement. Sometimes it's a matter of uh, sort of projects developing games, uh, trying to encourage people to become involved to kind of solve puzzles. Uh, sometimes they have a little bit of a competitive edge to them data mining and growing uh, databases of research by sort of turning it into an entertainment uh, uh, process uh, can certainly uh, inspire people to become involved. A competitive dimension quite often uh, helps uh, and so forth. I just want to very briefly touch on, on one example which has proven to be rather uh, successful uh, to say the least and this is the COVID data tracking project which you may well have come across its uh, references to it uh, surface here, there, and everywhere across our, our mediascape. Uh, quite often, it's not there's sort of there's no explanation of, of who they are, or where they've they've come from. So I would certainly encourage you to take a look at their their web presence. Uh, the COVID tracking project typed into Google will, will bring up a whole host of uh, different pages. It, it's in effect a, a volunteer organization which was launched uh, from with two journalists at the Atlantic magazine uh, in the U.S. back in March. Uh, they began to collaborate with uh, another individual who's part of the uh, uh, related science project. Um, a minute, and, please, Stuart. Uh, sorry, a couple of minutes left. Yeah, so they can. They kind of pooled their efforts and they brought together a, a, a whole hundreds of of, uh, of volunteer data gatherers, developers, scientists, reporters, designers, and the like. And uh, they're they're working together to produce an extraordinary amount of data, which uh, otherwise, as you can see in the slide there. Uh, they're arguing it wouldn't otherwise have been gathered. And uh, it's now regarded as, as such an important source that uh, newspapers uh, and well, other broadcasters and the like are routinely relying on it. And some of the more recent work has been looking at trying to pinpoint uh, racial and ethnic uh, data. They're doing this through a variety of different kinds of measures uh, to show that the, the pandemic is dis disproportionately affecting uh, black, indigenous, and, and people of color communities, as the website calls them, uh, three times more than likely than white people to contract uh, COVID-19 and so forth. So again, I recommend you uh, take a look at their website if you uh, if you haven't done so already. Uh, just to kind of then wrap up then, again, it's kind of drawing out the extent to which when you look at why there are such uh, social divisions and hierarchies uh, coming to light by the pandemic crisis, you recognize that, that quite often we are relying on statistical formulations. We're losing sight of, of the actual people involved and their everyday experiences of being on at the sharp end of so many of these exclusionary factors around class and gender and, and ethnicity and sexuality and, and age and the like. And here's where I think that citizen journalists can really play a role. And if we can sort of join up and connect citizen science and citizen journalism, uh, as sometimes happens in tentative, ad hoc, somewhat random kinds of ways. But I think if we can be begin to kind of systematize this and invest it in it, we can really find important ways of bringing to life these kinds of statistical formulations in a manner which can, I think, be really important. And just to my last slide here is just sort of highlighting some of, some of the issues which have kind of informed what I've been saying in this presentation, but which I, again, in sort of future would like work would like to kind of draw out and uh, and bring to the fore because I think they can start to kind of generate new uh, rather interesting avenues for further research. So I'll stop right there and say thank you very much. Great, thanks Stuart, that's really good um, and it's lovely to have some positives out of the pandemic like you're mentioning with the COVID tracking project. So if you have questions for Stuart don't forget to put them in the Q&A at the bottom 
and we'll come back to those later. But next up, we have John Rosenbeek, a postdoctoral research bifellow in psychology at Cambridge University. And he's going to talk to us um, about Go Viral, uh, which, if, if it's what I think it is, should be really exciting. So uh, please take it away, John. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, I am just trying to find uh, my presentation on my Zoom sharing screen. I have too many tabs open. Um, there it is. You've got Can it. everyone see this? I think so, right? Yeah. All right. Let me see if this is working. Um, sorry about that. Here we go. Yeah. So, all right. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I want to talk about two things, actually. One, um, some research that we did recently that actually ties in quite well to what Helen and Sear didn't talk about just now. And then also our, uh, well, share of the solution or our contribution to this, what we think of as, a, as one of the solutions to some of the problems that we've identified, um, which I hope will be very interesting, and I welcome everyone's questions. Um, I'll try to be as quick as I can to leave as much time as possible for the Q&A. Um, so without further ado, this is the, uh, the study that I want to talk about that we published in October in Royal Society of Open Science uh, Journal, um, which basically is, is um, a series of uh, samples or studies that we did in a variety of countries. In the UK, we had two samples, Ireland, the United States, Spain, and Mexico. Um, six samples in total with a total uh, sample size of 5,000, uh, which was kindly um, coordinated by the Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication uh, here at the University of Cambridge. And we had the plan to um, put all or most known predictors of susceptibility to misinformation about COVID-19 specifically, but also in general, um, into the same model because uh, quite a bit of research had been done already about like, what predicts um, why people fall for fake news about coronavirus, but uh, not in a very comprehensive manner. So um, what we tried to do basically was two things. One, okay, we're going to test these predictors internationally, and we're also going to put all of them in this, into the same model um, to see which of these predictors is actually the most consistent and the strongest um, that we know of, at least. Also, what we wanted to do was, uh, there has been some research done, which is very crucial into whether belief in COVID-19 misinformation um, predicts uh, people's self-reported compliance with health guidance measures like, hey, uh, I'm not going to wear a mask, and does my belief in misinformation about the virus influence this? Um, and the second one with vaccine intentions. So does believing in COVID misinformation affect whether you um, are uh, inclined to get vaccinated against coronavirus? Obviously, intuitively, we would say like, well, sure, but um, it's not quite clear, right, from the evidence. And also what we wanted to do is make sure that we have as comprehensive an analysis as possible of some of these questions. Um, so the way we classified misinformation about COVID is we uh, gave people six statements about COVID-19 that are clearly false. For example, the 5G network may be more susceptible to the virus. We also gave them two factual statements, one of them being uh, people with diabetes are at high risk of complications from coronavirus infection. Um, and one ambiguous statement, which is uh, taking ibuprofen might delay or uh, slow uh, coronavirus symptoms, which is partially true, partially not that true. It's, it's a bit complicated, right? And then we asked every, uh, for each of these questions, we asked participants on a one to seven scale, how reliable do you find the statement? Um, and what allow that allows us to do is, is to create an index, basically, of belief in uh, coronavirus misinformation. So if you score high on this index, you're more susceptible to misinformation. If you score low, you're less susceptible. Now, without really going into the details of uh, all of the analyses, because I don't want to bore everybody, um, what we did was we created a, a model, which we um, filled with different variables. One category of variables is standard demographic variables, so age, gender, education, political affiliation, and self-perceived minority status. So that can be any minority, not only uh, ethnic, but also uh, sexual minority, political minority, etc. Because we wanted to be flexible about that. Um, also, we put in known predictors of increased or reduced susceptibility to COVID-19 or to misinformation um, in general. So numeracy skills. Um, for which we used a, a pretty comprehensive measure of seven questions uh, that we asked people to answer uh, that basically 
try to uh, figure out people's um, critical thinking skills or cap um, capacities to, to deal with uh, data and numbers and so on. Uh, trust in scientists, trust in government, and trust in journalists. And then we had a few COVID specific predictors, number one being uh, people's risk perception of COVID-19, trust in how politicians are handling uh, coronavirus approach, trust in how the WHO is handling COVID approach, um, whether you seek out information about coronavirus on social media, and whether you seek out information about coronavirus from the WHO. So uh, what we did was we, we um, estimated an, a linear regression with this, with uh, susceptibility to coronavirus misinformation as the dependent variable, basically to see which of all of these predictors uh, predicts belief in uh, coronavirus misinformation the best. And this is what comes out. Um, I'm not sure if it's all that visible, but I, I sort of tried to collapse the whole uh, model into a single slide, which may not be the best way to do it, but I think you can read it. Um, basically, if uh, like further, if the bar is further to the right, it means that people are more susceptible to, to coronavirus misinformation. You can see with age is increased age, so higher age being older is associated in four countries with lower susceptibility to misinformation about coronavirus and higher uh, susceptibility to misinformation about coronavirus in Mexico, as you can see here. Um, so the two that stand out the most really in terms of reducing people's susceptibility to misinformation are numeracy skills and trust in scientists. Um, the strongest predictor for higher susceptibility to misinformation is, is uh, self-perceived minority status and getting information from social media. Um, we didn't really have any hypotheses directly about why minority status would predict higher susceptibility to misinformation, but there is some literature that, uh, that has looked at this over the past 20 years or so. Um, it's interesting. I don't really want to get into it right now, but um, that's mainly because I want to get to the rest of the story. Um, and getting information from social media is a uh, is a very very interesting activity. That seeking out um, the, like news stories about COVID on social media seems to be associated with higher susceptibility to misinformation, or makes you more likely to believe that misinformation about coronavirus is true. Um, so what we also did was um, looking at the association between belief in COVID nineteen misinformation and uh, health behaviors, as I explained before. So we asked people the question, would you get vaccinated against COVID-19 if a vaccine became available with yes or no as a possible response option? And here we also built a model, a uh, logistic regression in this case, with uh, common demographic variables, again, as before, age, gender, education, political affiliation, minority status, also numeracy skills and trusted scientists, and also uh, susceptibility to misinformation, basically. And uh, we did a logistic regression with that. So this is what comes out of that. So here, basically, um, if the bar is further to the right, that means it's associated with higher intentions to get vaccinated. So for example, um, being older here in, uh, well, two out of four, uh, sorry, in the, these are just four countries. We didn't have Ireland in this one um, because of issues with the survey data collection. But let's say you look at the United Kingdom, then being older is associated with higher willingness to get vaccinated against COVID. But also, interestingly, uh, trust in scientists, high, higher trust in scientists, which is predictable, right? But misinformation, believing in misinformation about COVID, is strongly associated with lower vaccine intentions. Uh, and we find essentially the same thing for um, health behaviors like wearing a mask and social distancing and things like that. That misinformation stands out as a, as a pretty good. Uh, unique predictor of uh, reduced willingness to comply with health health guidance measures and also lower willingness to get vaccinated. So that's kind of worrying. Um, so what we wanted to do really is, okay, what uh, predicts lower susceptibility to misinformation? Turns out that, um, as Helen discussed, one of the very important things, as you see here, is um, numeracy, but you can also translate that not, not necessarily as numerical thinking, but it also is also very much associated with uh, critical thinking. So what we wanted to do was to see, okay, well, what can we do to improve people's critical thinking skills 
when it comes to coronavirus and coronavirus misinformation. And that's sort of grounded in the idea that we want to up people's defenses against uh, dark arts as the state has so badly put. So what we did uh, in collaboration with uh, DROH, which is a Dutch organization, and uh, the cabinet office created a game called Go Viral, where your, your role is uh, in a safe environment to create and spread your own fake news about COVID. And uh, it's, it's about five minutes it takes to play and it's really simple, meaning you have to like click a response option and uh, reason your way through how um, coronavirus spreads. And we've done this before with different types of social games and the, the, the results of that basically show that people become less susceptible to misinformation after playing. Um, and we want to see if that's uh, the case here as well. And um, the esteemed audience of this talk is the first to see this uh, because we haven't submitted this paper yet. So please get to yourselves if you don't mind. Um, but we conducted a pre-registered multi-country randomized control trial in the United Kingdom, Germany, and France with the uh, English, German, and French versions of Go Viral that we created. And we had uh, three conditions go viral. Um, the uh, infographics about coronavirus misinformation created by UNESCO and a control condition, namely Tetris. So in the go viral condition, people play the game all the way through. In the UNESCO condition, they read these infographics and in the control condition, they play Tetris for five minutes. And our questions were, does playing go viral or reading the uh, infographics improve people's ability to spot manipulative content about coronavirus? Does it improve people's confidence in their ability to do so? And does it reduce people's self-reported willingness to share misinformation about COVID with others? Um, this is what we found, and this is where I will stop as well, because I very much welcome your questions. Uh, again, currently writing up the results, but um, essentially we find that people who play the Go Viral game uh, become uh, much better at spotting fake news, let's say, about COVID. Uh, in whatever form you present it, and that effect lasts for about a week, uh, at least one week, uh, after playing this game initially. And we also find a significant effect for reading the infographics, although uh, it is not as large as uh, for the Go Viral game, because it takes less time and less cognitive effort. So I very much look forward to your questions, and if you have any uh, questions to me personally, please email me as well on jgr 51 at cam.pc.uk. Um, Thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you, John. A uh, very timely talk there, very interesting and exciting, and I don't know if I unblind your study or anything by saying that I've done it myself, but um, anyway. Uh, so I'd now like to invite uh, Lawrence McGinty uh, to come and respond to these very interesting talks. Yeah. Um, all, all of them are, are fascinating. Um, what particularly struck me about what Helen Kennedy had to say was uh, her emphasis on uh, critical thinking, which also came up uh, uh, this morning and also came up in, in what other people were saying. Um, and the, the, well, it's not an issue, but the, the, the thought I have about this is um, whether this is sufficiently uh, taught um, in uh, before you get to a uh, university uh, or, or even after you get to university for that matter um, because uh, it, it does seem to me to be the, the key factor um, maybe I'm overplaying it a little but it does seem to be one of the most important anyway um, and it doesn't seem to me to be uh, uh, to be one that's taught certainly not in schools um, and, and perhaps not enough in an university. I was also struck by, by what Helen had to say about um, inequalities, which um, in effect decrease trust. Um, and I think that, that also showed up in, in uh, John's talk um, when he was uh, looking, at, looking at some of his uh, results. Um, and I'm, 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 a, I'm not exactly mystified but I'm a bit puzzled about why this should happen. Why is it that if you're a, a member of a disadvantaged group for one reason or another, uh, why is it that, um, uh, uh, that, that you should be, uh, should decrease trust? Is, is it 
because uh, of a lack of education in the widest possible sense of that? Or is it more specific? Uh, or, or is it the way that um, uh, groups have been treated in the past by powerful bodies that made them suspicious of anything they're saying now? I, I, I don't know. I wonder if any research has been done on that. Um, Stuart, I thought, was absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, and especially when he pointed out that one of the one, one of the few good things to come out of the uh, COVID epidemic is um, that there is lots of COVID citizen science. Um, I, I personally, I've been doing uh, one of these citizen science uh, apps uh, since, well, practically since the beginning of the epidemic, uh, the, the Zoe app, um, and it it struck me um, because I'm that's the one I know. Um, it struck me that one of the things that they claim to have pretty much discovered by uh, people, over four million of them, uh, signing up for the app, is that a loss of sense to smell was a distinctive uh, symptom, symptom uh, of COVID. Has, I wonder whether that is happening in other places too, not, not necessarily with symptoms, but with other things. And that does link uh, to what uh, John Rosebeck was talking about, because there again, um, we've got this um, th this fact that misinforma misinformation, or willingness to believe, susceptibility to misinformation, um, is is a strong predictor for vaccination acceptance. Um, and, and as John said, that's worrying. Um, but it also uh, takes us back to what Helen was saying that. Um, if it's a, uh, the, the two big factors that John pointed out were numeracy and trust in sciences, um, and again, uh, in, in uh, the, the, the things that make people more susceptible to misinformation, uh, were being in disadvantaged groups. Now, that seems to me to uh, throw a focus on um, are we taking, or is science taking seriously enough in, in, in many respects um, the effects of being in disadvantaged groups um, because if it isn't we're not going to get across a, a, a message that encourages people to be vaccinated um, and we're not going to be able to get across uh, messages about other things as well like uh, uh, prophylactic measures uh, wearing masks and so on uh, and to me all, all three of those talks had, were linked around those two two factors, inequalities um, and uh, critical thinking. Um, those to me were the two things that stood out this afternoon. Brilliant, thanks Lawrence. Um, that's great and I imagine that the speakers will want to respond to your response um, but I, I might um, Perhaps, perhaps that is the best thing to do to start off because there is a big question here that, that seems very important about um, the impact of being in a disadvantaged group that I imagine that all three speakers um, could talk to. Um, I, I think perhaps uh, Helen was raising that first, is that right? Would you want to, to start? Yeah, I'll respond to that and um, a couple of other things that Lawrence said and one of the questions in the chat all at once, okay. if that's okay, just to sort well, of that's, uh, that's good skills. get the conversation going. I mean, I think if what Lawrence has taken away is that um, inequalities matter and critical thinking matters, then my work here is done. Uh, because, yeah, you know, uh, I agree. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you, you were asking is critical thinking taught before people get to university? Are we were sort of waiting too late to introduce it as a, um, as a skill. And I think it is actually taught, but possibly in unexpected places and linking that up to the kinds of issues that we're talking about here now, maybe um, is the challenge ahead. So you talk critical thinking in history at A level, because you're taught to understand history as constructed, aren't you? Not not as facts, but actually as interpretation and as narrative. It's taught in media studies, because in media studies you're taught to deconstruct media texts. So actually, you know, it, it's just a bit um, hidden away in unexpected subjects, I think. I think that's a challenge. Um, 
there was, there's a question from Stella O'Brien. Is any organisation developing appropriate educational material for graphicacy when the average adult literacy level in the UK is that of a 12 year old and our numeracy is that of a, a nine year old? Um, and a couple of things that I wanted to say there, sort of linking it again to the um, conversation about critical thinking. Um, so I, th I do think, you know, what quite commonly gets said is all oh, we need more data literacy in schools and that would include um, maybe critical thinking skills. I think there are, you know, we have to take seriously the massive logistical challenges of doing that. Like what subject would you put it in? Because if you put it in maths, then, you know, you've got the, the, a lot of people switching off already. Um, how would you make that happen? You know, a, you know, a well-connected professor of education might persuade a government minister that that needs to happen. Ooh, you know, quite unlikely. And then, so then what do you do? Sort of try to get into schools at a local level where teachers are really, you know, over monitored and over measured and trying to sort of meet all sorts of demands. And then what about everyone that's already left school? Because, you know, they're actually pr possibly the population that kind of matter a bit more. So, you know, how we um, work these questions through and also like through a lens of inequality um, is, is massively challenging. And I don't think we should underestimate um, that challenge. I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, John, we noted that in John's research, self-perceived minority status, I would really want to unpack that term <laughs> and know what that means. Mm. That, that was a factor that affected people's um, uh, susceptibility to misinformation because, you know, do I feel like I'm a minority because the government's telling me to wear a mask? Or, you know, is it actually more <laughs> genuine kind of social inequalities here? But can I just say one more final thing, chucking it in there, Please, can we be specific about the social media that we're talking about? And if we mean Facebook, can we say Facebook? Because I think social media platforms are getting used and mobilized in all sorts of different ways, especially, you know, some quite interesting ways um, that target different populations and that are different around the globe. And I think we need a bit of specificity when we're talking about what's going on with social media. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. That's an excellent set of answers. Um, I see Stuart's unmuted himself. I don't know if that means he's preparing himself to answer next, but I was intending to go to, to Stuart actually, because um, uh, just uh, um, to perhaps address some, uh, Lawrence also raised a point about um, citizen science and whether findings like the, the loss of smell were, were more broad and whether that's something that you uh, had seen elsewhere um, but also yes if you would like to address any of those other issues and also there is a question asking whether citizen science just means amateur uh, I think you addressed that somewhat in your your um, discussion anyway didn't you yes maybe I'll, I'll start there if I may and I'll, I'll try to be brief um, that is I think in, in general a fair point that typically uh, amateur and citizen mean the same thing. I think what's what's different uh, in these contexts, though, is the extent to which it becomes value laden, and that is for some it's a pejorative kind of term, uh, whereas others actually recognise that you know another way of thinking about the amateur is that uh, someone who's motivated to to get engaged because of a, a love of what it is that uh, is at, at heart and. Uh, so for them, it's a very positive kind of point of affiliation. So we, we have to kind of think about who's using the notion of, of the amateur uh, in this context and what they mean by it. Um, I, I thank Lawrence for his very uh, thoughtful uh, comments. And uh, what I like, well, several things I like, but, but the one I'll draw out is the, it, it, he's kind of inviting us to kind of reverse the more familiar kinds of logics. And that is to actually start with the questions of inequality and then see, how they can then be uh, advanced in our thinking uh, rather than the more traditional or more typical kind of way. And that is that, you know, inequalities are discovered and then that's, that's in itself the, the finding and where the analysis ends. And I think what we, we, we're at the point now where these are well past the point of just being important in their own right for purposes of research. 
uh, because they are going to take on a strategic significance as we begin to roll out the vaccine. And, and we've got to kind of figure out what's actually happening in these different uh, communities where questions, especially of trust or lack thereof, uh, may well prove to be uh, uh, you know, fundamentally important. I think from a journalistic point of view, I was trying to kind of think that through in relation to citizen uh, journalism, uh, the extent to which journalists can sort of tap the expertise of the citizen in these communities to kind of be involved in that kind of way of, of figuring out what's happening. But also, and, and I know that there are many people involved in this symposium would be far more knowledgeable about this than I am, the extent to which different communication strategies are sufficiently self-reflexive to recognize that they have to be recalibrated and that they have to kind of tap into these, this kind of, of expertise within communities in order to, to recraft and recalibrate and rethink you know, what it is that they are doing so as to attend to that kind of messaging with sufficient specificity that it resonates and that people then get it and, and, and appreciate why it's important to be vaccinated and so forth. So I think, yeah, I, I, I quite like that sort of set of tensions that are coming to the fore. Thank you. Great, thank you, Stuart. Um, John, I mean, um, it was really interesting data you presented there and I wonder whether you wanted to start by taking on um, Lawrence's question of, of the way in which being in disadvantaged groups um, are having an influence and, and maybe kind of go from there in terms of your... Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, well, I think as Helen very correctly pointed out, um, we didn't specifically ask that people were an ethnic minority or anything like that. We very deliberately asked them, do you consider yourself to be a minority of any kind, right? Which can be basically anything um, from ethnic to as exactly as Helen said, um, if you think of yourself as, uh, you know, someone who uh, is very skeptical of, let's say, immigration um, and is feeling like they're becoming a minority in their own country, they could also answer yes to that question, right? So in that sense, it's very much an imperfect measure um, for, uh, you know, being disadvantaged, I would say. I don't, I don't necessarily want to associate this question that we asked with being dis from a disadvantaged group specifically. Uh, nonetheless, um, there is some research that looks at, uh, you know, minority status. Uh, let me see, it's specifically, I think, from the, um, where is this? Yeah, this is from the 90s already, so it was quite a while ago someone did research on, uh, I think it was people from Muslim backgrounds in the Netherlands, and they found that there was uh, people from these backgrounds had um, believed in conspiracy theories of a certain variety, but not only conspiracy theories that were about um, Muslims or Islam, but also about other things that are unrelated, let's say the moon landing, uh, more than other people. Um, and they um, associate this also with like, as you said, like marginalization, um, in some way, but it's, it's, it's very much a, a field of research that I don't have a lot of expertise in myself, and, but I'm very interested in, in learning more about this. And it's one of the questions that's definitely raised by uh, this finding, which I think is extremely interesting. Um, but I don't really want to draw any kind of firm conclusions on as to why this is or how consistent this is over time, how consistent it is uh, for domains outside of coronavirus, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things, for example, that we weren't able to control for, as uh, Miland, I think in the questions pointed out, is religiosity and also uh, socioeconomic status, right? So we didn't put these two factors, which you could envision being very, very important, into the same model. So we don't know uh, from this research whether self-perceived minority status is a unique predictor, even when controlling for those factors. Um, so... Yeah, those are those I think are, are extremely interesting questions uh, that we, we we do need to look more at in some way. Also, because we did the statistics, right? We we found a, an association that works out in terms of the numbers, but that's all we did. So we didn't hypothesize that this would be a, a predictor, nor did we um, dig any deeper into this finding. Uh, which I, I hardly encourage other people to do, or even if we get the opportunity to do so, that would be also very interesting. Um, I think Lyle's question, if I may answer it now uh, quickly. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, so uh, the, the game was uh, launched in early October and it was co-promoted by the UK Cabinet Office. 
and the United Nations. So um, we've had, I think, about around about 300,000 people played it by this point, I think. Um, and it's, it's been translated to French and German and is now almost launched in Italian and Polish as well, and we're creating other translations. So um, the potential for sure is there to reach a large audience, uh, which is very nice, I think. Um, the, uh, yeah, well, it, we, we were very happy for people to use it as like an educational tool in classrooms as far as media literacy trainings go and so on. Uh, that would be wonderful. Um, but we mostly envisioned it as like a standalone project that is like an entertaining game first, right? We tried to be a little bit lighthearted about it as well and not approach it as the world's greatest threat, um, but also, you know, allow people to, to, to have fun while playing. Um, so hopefully it achieved that at least a little bit. Okay. Well, um, that's good. And uh, there, the, Milan had two questions for you. One was about um, how to prevent susceptibility to misinformation. And um, I guess what he seems to be driving towards is, is a similar kind of religiosity in tendency to put your uh, allegiance to people. I mean, it felt like having done the go viral, the idea was a very quick intervention. And I don't know whether you feel like it's possible to build that kind of training that he suggests into that. Um, so let me see if I understand the question correctly. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. So the, the game is basically intended as, as something akin to a psychological vaccine um, against future deception events. But much like uh, the coronavirus vaccine is not going to be as effective for people who have coronavirus, right? It's meant to be a preemptive measure. Um, if you already very, very firmly believe misinformation about COVID, then um, it's not likely that the game will be as effective in terms of teaching you how this kind of misinformation or these misinformation techniques work. Um, at least in theory, we'd have to test it, of course. Um, so in that sense, like someone who's very, very heavily invested in a particular political ideology of some kind, and that political ideology is in some way associated with you know, proliferation of misinformation about coronavirus or something else, um, it's, it's really difficult to make someone unbelieve something that they are really invested in believing. And I don't think that a five-minute game is enough for that, honestly. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, Miland is also interested in the URL for your game. Um, oh, goviralgame.com. Um, okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. I don't know if Helen is still there. I might quickly indulge myself in a, a, a question for you. Um, I wonder, you talked about the complex ecologies of trust at the end of your uh, presentation, and I wonder whether that might go some way towards explaining for Lawrence about why being in a disadvantaged um, uh, group. Well, actually, no, I mean, I suppose that's what he's asking is, is um, why mistrust is an issue of social justice. So perhaps, uh, perhaps I've just uh, pointed out and re-asked Lawrence's question, I'm not sure. Yeah. But um, the, other, the other thing I wanted to ask was uh, you talked about uh, with regards to uh, data visualization informing and then what? But uh, earlier in the day, we had David Spiegelhalter and Kevin McConway, and Dave, David Spiegelhalter had written um, a paper in Nature saying that the idea of evidence communication is to inform and not persuade. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I suppose that implies a vacuum almost, it's an absence. And, you know, if you're not persuading, then are you inevitably doing something else? Um, uh, I just thought I'd ask that one. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, in terms of the latter question, I think we're differently positioned with different roles, aren't we? And so I think he was talking about statisticians or scientists' roles. Um, I think um, the role of journalism is sometimes to persuade or the agenda of journalism is sometimes to persuade. And there is definitely an intention you know, to persuade people to have the vaccine, isn't there? Without doubt, because it is believed that that is 
pro-social and for the public good and is the route out of the pandemic. So differently situated actors have different intentions, I think, when we sort of um, mobilise data and statistics. In relation to the question about um, trust and inequalities, um, so, you know, I think what, what Rua Benjamin and others would argue that is that, um, you know, racism is infrastructural. And so if structures are racist, how can we expect black people, my, racially minoritized groups to trust them? That, you know, it's not surprising. As, and if they have experienced racism, then it isn't surprising that they are then uh, not trusting in those systems and those um, structures. I, do, I would just to, just, um, to add, um, you know, responding to what John said about those studies in the Netherlands, I would, I, I would really caution against sort of anyone taking away, you know, any belief like Muslims believe in conspiracy theories. You know, I, I want to know how that research was undertaken, who with, what the questions were. You know, th there's a danger here, isn't there, in, in misleading? Or we've already sort of identified, and John's acknowledged that self-identified minority status is a very particular category that may not be telling us that, you know, socially unequal groups or uh, racial minorities are more likely to, um, you know, believe misinformation. So I just want to caution against taking anything away from there, which might not help us to break down social inequalities, which I'm sure we all want to do. Excellent. Okay, well, that's the end of our allotted time. There's um an interesting question from Kevin Webb in the chat where I think it, it may be a case that uh, David Spiegelhalter and, and uh, Kevin McConway were highlighting earlier of trying to avoid <laughs> asking questions that um, don't quite speak to um, scientists expertise but if you felt like tackling it <coughs> whilst we uh, move on um, then please do. Um, but yeah so I think it's uh, I, I, I will close this session now and um, there's I see in the program that there's a five minute gap but I don't know whether you actually want to do that Anne or not. Anne? Um, I think we go just carry on and then because it's only down to 10 15 minutes okay so um, okay yeah right well thanks everybody thank you Lawrence John Stuart and Helen and uh, I'll pass over to Anne. Okay thank you.